Good evening, Rabotai. Got to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Sometime at the end of the week, it's not easy to be able to come out to learn. It's a long week. We come to the end of the week, we're tired, especially a Thanksgiving weekend. So many people are away. That's the reason why I gave the Nishmat Kochai share Tuesday night. <laughs> because I know Thursday, they're already gone. So how are they going to hear about the big thank you? The Thanksgiving of Klal Yisrael. The Nishmat Kol Chai. That's why I said it on Tuesday. Because Thursday, already we might not have a shot at him. But I appreciate that everybody came out tonight. Borei Olam should give the right words to be able to give over this year properly. Because tonight we're going to hit on such a big topic. Tonight it's behind the scenes of a story that we thought we knew. And those, those, those things are always very moving because we grew up so bent on a certain understanding of a story as we were kids. And then later on when we come back to the amazing saga of the parasha and we find out an completely behind the scenes story that we never thought ever existed. But then we realize that we've been missing pieces of the puzzle all along. And that goes to demonstrate that it's a mechaev on every single person. Number one, never to take for granted what we think we know. Secondly, to realize that a person, when he was young and he learned what he learned, it was good for when he was young. But don't be complacent. Don't be, don't be content with what you came out with in elementary school as that's it. There's so much in Torah, even in what we would think is Pashu Pshat, and there's so much behind the scenes. There's so much depth. Tonight we'd like to demonstrate one of those examples. Kedarkenu Bakodesh, Borei Olam Shav Rachmanu tonight, because I'm a little bit under the weather. Let's start with a bit of Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Shahakol. Nihia bidvaro. I'd like to start with a phenomenon. I think this is fantastic. Such a davar behipucho, the difference between Klal Israel and the Goim. And I think it's very matim. These days with the elections and you have constantly the new people that are being appointed, politicians, and they're telling you everything about they're going to do and how and where and this guy's going to be appointed to this and that guy to that and the Supreme Court. I'd like to show you something I think is an an eye-opener. When it comes to the greatest acts in Klal Yisrael, there's sometimes... Hinted to by Torah in one word. Something you would think that the Torah would go out and plaster on the headlines of the front page of every parasha. Some of the biggest things that our Avot Akdoshim did, and yet it's hinted to in one word. A remez. Hardly even spoken about. Example. The first Jew to give his life away, Al Yedek Kiddush Hashem. Abraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu was thrown into the fire by Nimrod. And it was over there that Abraham Avinu miraculously walked out unscathed. Where do we know this story from? You won't find this story in Torah. Bechlal. Don't you think a story like that should have been told? Abraham Avinu. Such a young age. And he was ready to die all your day, Kiddush Hashem. Don't you think that that's something that we should know about? Don't you know that it's because of that that we, Klal Yisrael, have in our DNA the concept that we say in Amidah three times a day, Leman Shemo Be'ahava Hareni Muchan Limsor 
et atzmi al yideh kiddush Hashem. You know where you got that from? You got that from the fact that you are an you are an anical. You are a great 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 grandchild of Abraham Avinu. Abraham jumped into the fire al yideh kiddush Hashem. You are able to be moser nafshecha al yideh kiddush Hashem. Shouldn't I know that story? Wouldn't that be so important to me and you? Doesn't that define our essence as Jews in Galut? How many times we had to die in the last 2,000 years? The Spanish Inquisition, they jumped in the fires. They jumped in screaming Shema Yisrael. How were they able to do that? Because they came from Abraham Avinu who jumped into the fire. We had Jews that were bold enough to stand on the lines, going into a gas chamber, singing Animamin. They knew, they knew good and well that whoever went in did not come out. They knew what was going about to happen to them. And they went in, Bikdushav Tahora, and they did it singing. Singing. Where did they get that koach from? Because they came from this super incredible giant that at a very young age was able to give his life away. Shouldn't I know about that story? It defines us. It got us through Galut. Shouldn't I know about this story? And yet, you know what the Torah tells us about this story? In one word. And it doesn't even tell us the story. It's a remez. Pasuk says, Ur Kazdim. Says Rashi, why was it called Ur Kazdim? The fire of Kazdim. Says Rashi, you want to know why? Because that was the place in that fire, Nimrod threw Abraham Avinu into the fire saying that if your God really is of sorts, let's see him save you. So the whole story, Rashi brings on one word. Ur Kazdim, the biggest thing in the world, mentioned in one tiny word. Unbelievable. Ur Kazdim. Another example of about the tremendous things that our Avot Doshim did, and it is not mentioned, only Miramez. This week's parasha. Vayese Yaakov, Be'er Sheva, Echarana, he went and he rested there that night and he slept there that night. Says Rashi, what a funny Lashon. And he rested there. I mean, generally, the only place you can rest is in the place that you're at. Says Rashi, no, no. It's coming to be medayik and tell you something powerful. Vayalen sham ki bahashemesh. There he rested. Lilamedcha to teach you that the prior 14 years that he just came from Shem Ve'ever, that he was in yeshiva, he did not sleep, not day and not night. This is the first night in 14 years that he slept there. Lohodia to tell you that for the 14 years prior to this, when he was in yeshiva, he didn't sleep at all. If I want to tell my son Yitzchak Zev, Yitzchak Zev, I want you to go to yeshiva and I want you to give it your all. The guys in my share, they... They, they, they make fun of their Rebbe because they know that every time I dropped off Yitzchak Zev by the mirror, I always tell him, Yitzchak Zev, listen to Rebbe. Chaparain. Don't let the time go. Grab, grab. Chatof, achil. Chatof, chatof. Grab as much as you can. Rebbe's giving you the gems. He's giving you the diamonds of this week. This year's Masechta. This year you're learning Baba Kama. Sure. Bor, Mave, Hever, jump in, grab it. You grab it now, it'll be so much easier later on to come back to it. What you learn when you're young is clear as day. Later on, you remember it like a clean duff, 
like something that was written on a clean parchment, clean pair piece of paper. That which you learn when you're older, says the Gemara, that already is like something that was written on a daf mahuk. It's like something that was written on a page that already had all types of erasings. It's not as bahir. It's not as clear. It's because of chaparayim. Give it all you got. You come from Yaakov Avinu. When he went to yeshiva, he didn't sleep day and night for 14 years. My son's going to look at me and say, where'd you get that from? Where'd you get that from? I don't remember anywhere in the Torah it said that uh, Yaakov Avinu uh, went to Yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever when he left his parents' house on the way to Lavan. I know that his father, his mother, they told him, go, run for your life. Esav is coming. I know the Maisa with Eliphaz. But after that, I thought that the next scene was Yaakov pulling into the house of Lavan. Or at least meeting Rachel. And then pulling into Lavan. There were 14 years there that I'm missing. That he went to yeshiva first. And he didn't sleep one night in 14 years. Shouldn't we know that? Wouldn't that give us inspiration to know what, a, what, what, what it means for a guy to go to yeshiva? I mean, wouldn't that tell us what it means to go into a yeshiva for the real deal? I try to explain to parents. It's not easy. So many boys over the years, they graduated high school. <laughs> I begged and pleaded to parents, I'm begging you, let the kid go to Israel just for six months. I'm telling you, it could be the biggest year of his life. He can get away from Brooklyn. He can get away from the community. He can get away from the glitz and the glamour. He can get away from the money. He can get away from the cars and the houses and the schmutz. He can go to Yerushalayim Yer HaKodesh. He can go to Eretz Yisrael. Avir the Yisrael machkim. It, just the ear. Just, just taking in the ear of Eretz Yisrael already sharpens a person and makes them a bigger, better ben Torah, a bigger person. And the parents always say to me, ah, come on, Rabbi, what's the difference between the yeshivot there and the yeshivot here? What's the difference? My gosh, what's the difference? Over there, there's still people. There, there's, there's still people that, don't get me wrong, in Lakewood, Baruch Hashem, we, we still have, you know, Ka'eli Yeshivot here in America as well. But I remember those years when I was in Yeshivat Itri in Yerushalayim, those four years. I wouldn't trade those years of my life for nothing, for nothing. I mean, we still, we, Thursday night, there was no such thing. I mean, a guy, the whole Bet Midrash was up till two, three in the morning in the Bet Midrash. And then when you finally finish what they called the Mishmar Nacht, you know, that was the Mishmar night. So at two, three in the morning, the taxis would pull in and they would take us to the hotel. But this was Kisad there every Thursday night. This was... This was the, you know, because Thursday night was the Chazara night where we would re, we review everything we, you know, basically did that week. Bekeud, Be'eyun, all the Shiurim. So you're up very late. And then the taxis would pull in, take you to the Kotel. You'd be able to come now, uh, Vatikin, at that morning in the Kotel. And you sat there with thousands of people. You would think like, does anybody in this city sleep? I don't think anybody in Yerushalayim sleeps, I'll be honest with you. It's amazing. Anywhere you go at any time of day and night, there's always hustle and bustle. Everywhere they go. You come to the Kotel Vatikim, how many minyanim you have? 30, 40, 50 minyanim outside. Now, you'd see the Kotel in Corona, you would, you would, you, you would, you'd be beside yourself. You'd see those little kubiot and cubicles, what they made out of, ah, Come on, what happened? What, what happened to the Kote? It would hurt you. It really would hurt you. You come to a crowd like that. Thousands of people praying Vatikin Friday morning. And each minyan going his own pace. 
and the ra'ash. And then suddenly, on the drop of a dime, at the same second, the entire swarm of a yam of people goes hush. It's a feeling of serenity on earth. All you hear is the birds circling. And even they stop as if they stand stilling right in front of Melech Malchei Malachim. Vizeh Shar HaShamayim. Do you know what it is to taste something like that? To live something like that? I would love to show that to my kid. But I'd love to show it to him Yaakov Avinu, this was your Zayda, this was your grandfather. This is the way he went to yeshiva. How do we know about the story? From a diuk. Vayalen <laughs> Sham. From the word Sham, Rashi is Medayik. Oh, there he slept. Mashma, that up until now, the last 14 years, he went to yeshiva for real. What happened? Why, why did you tell me the mice? Tell me the story. Lay it out with all the detail. Give it to me with the schmaltz. Let me hear it. The way you tell a story. No. One word. Why? How come these great things, great action, amazing things done by Avota, and it was just with a hint of one word. And I think it's from here that you see something incredibly different between us and the Goyim. By the Goyim, when a Goy does something tiny, minor, and small of a good deed, <laughs> he plasters it everywhere. <laughs> he, takes, he takes the smallest, littlest, small mashu of a, you know, he held, the, he held the door open for somebody. Whoa! He puts it on social media. I did my good deed for the day. What the day? The month. I did mine. And he lets everybody know. Yeah, yeah, you don't know how great of a guy I am. Karma, karma. They're into the karma. Ah! I opened the door. That's it. Today, I got all the mazel in the world. You need to listen to the way Goim talk. It's unbelievable. They do the smallest things and they make the biggest talk out of it. Kalal Yisrael is exactly the opposite. We do the biggest things and we keep it quiet. It's amazing. But that's a lesson. A lesson of Avot HaGdoshim. Abba, I'm not doing it for the fanfare. I'm not doing it for the marketing. I'm doing it for you. And as long as you know, that's all that matters to me. I think that's a big message, especially when you're living in such superficial times where things are so fake. It's such a breath of air to meet a real Jew. And, and one of those definitions of a real Jew is somebody that does great things Besheket. Besheket. That was the Avot Akdoshi. Take a look. How the great things they did. You know what it is not to sleep for 14 years? <laughs> We're not even going to mention it. Shut. Shows you. I didn't do it for the fanfare. I did it for Abba. I did it because the Zuhi Torah. That's the way you learn. It's not here to advertise. It's not about me. It's about what is Torah. It's for Abba. Abba knows I'm happy. What is Mesirut Nefesh? It's for Abba. Abba knows, says Abraham Avinu, I'm happy. I don't need the write up, I don't need the article in the uh, magazine. I don't need the coverage. Lehefech. I don't want my name on buildings. I want it in the next world. I don't want the kavod here in this world. People have to be very careful with these things. This is not a ben Torah hashkafa. Don't get me wrong. We, we give kavod to those who are machzik Torah in the biggest and highest, you know, we make dinners and we give them 
you know, rewards awards and we, 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 we give him whatever it takes. But at the end of the day, you should know. The bigger the act, the quieter the response. The quieter the response, the bigger the person. Take a look at that with Akdushin. This should say something to us. And if this is the case, now I'm going to hit you. Because we're going to segue now from this as the proper intro to one of the biggest and quietest acts that were done in the history of the Jewish people that will be the reason for the coming of Mashiach. It'll be the reason of bringing back Klal Yisrael to Eretz Yisrael, and it's an action that was done behind the scenes without anybody knowing about it, and many people go through their lives and they never even knew this took place. So tonight, let me tell you the story behind the story. Ah. Yaakov Avinu, he comes to the house of Lavan, the trickster, Lavan Ha'arami. And there he meets Rachel Imenu. Chazal tell us, Apiruach HaKodesh, Yaakov Avinu, one look on Rachel, and he knew, ah, this is my zivuk. And it's with this that Yaakov Avinu goes, and he tirelessly, you think in yeshiva, he learned, Yomam Valayl without sleep, for Lavan, he worked the way he learned in yeshiva. With the same hasmada, with the same matmid. Yomam Valayla, without sleep. Amazing. For seven years, he works. Just for the hand of Rachel Imenu. And after seven years, Yaakov Avinu comes to Lavan and he says, It's time to give me my wife. Hold to your deal. This is what we made up. Originally, when Eliezer, Eved Avraham, came with the camels of gold and silver and the dowry was delivered, ha ha, Lavan's expectations were tremendous when he hears that the house of Abraham is coming back for another Bazra, for another Shidduch. He was expecting the camels. We know the Midrash, that he even checked the mouth of, Ab- of Yaakov Avinu. He checked the ears of Yaakov Avinu. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Can you even imagine something like that? The guy's looking through the ears and the mouth of Yaakov. Maybe he has a diamond. Of it. But finally, they had to make a deal. And it was there that Lavan decides, seven years, you can have her. At the end of seven, Yaakov says, give me my life. Lavan says, you worked your seven years. Here's your wife. Let's make a wedding. Now, Rabotai, we know that what took place. Lavan Ha'arami. We know this is the parasha where Lavan goes and switches. Le'af for Rachel. And now, sure enough, behind the veil, and obviously you could understand the veil in those days, it's not the veil of today. If they used the veil of today, we wouldn't have a story. <laughs> In those days, they knew what a covering meant. Today, we're battling what should be covered. <laughs> the coverings in our weddings is, 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 is not a simple battle. But nonetheless, there was, there was a veil. A veil of old times. And that veil literally could not Give forward, reveal the face of the Kala. Such siniut, such kedusha, And it's because of that, that Chazal, the Torah tells us, the next morning Yaakov Avinu wakes up after the wedding. Vehine le'a. And it was somebody else. I'd like to pause just for a moment. Does that tell you something about Yaakov Avinu? The next morning? He found out that he nailed it. This isn't a topic I can really talk about openly. And it's also definitely not a topic I can talk about while being taped. But I will tell you, make a mental note. 
Yaakov Avinu did not know who the girl was until the next morning. That means that when he went into the Maase Zivug, it was with such Kedusha, such Tahora, such Siniut, such Kavanot. This was a moment of a incredible beginning of a Kalal Yisrael. Where was his mind? Where was his eyes? Where, where was his heart? The next morning, Just leave it at that. But nonetheless, the next morning, Leah, Yaakov Avinu comes to Tana with Lavan, you trickster, you tricked me. Lavan says, listen, this is the way of our city. We don't give the hand of the older, the younger before the older. And if that's the case, if you want the younger, you had to go through the older first. So Yaakov, Yaakov says, give me my wife. I want Rachel. Lavan says, I'll give you Rachel. You won't have to wait. We'll make another wedding immediately. But you're going to have to work for me another seven years. And as they say, the rest is history. And that's the story we grew up with, Rabotai. This is the story we grew up with. How did it go down? How did the story take place? So we know, Rabotai, that Yaakov Avinu knew good and well who he was dealing with. Achi ut. He's a Ramai? I know how to deal with liars, said Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov knew good and well. Whether it be this excuse or that, Lavan is not going to play as a straight shooter. He had a chash that he was going to pull something here. So as we all know, and I have not telling you any chidushim yet, wait, the fireworks are coming. But this is just to get us into the story. As we all know, Yaakov Avinu goes and he makes simanim with Rachel. Oh. So Yaakov Avinu is in cahoots with Rachel. He makes a certain siman, certain codes. And the game plan was that when Yaakov Avinu comes up to the kala under the chupa behind the veil to make sure it's the right girl, he's going to ask certain questions and she's going to have to give back the proper answers. Those answers were the simanim, the codes, to be able to show that this is Be'etzem Rachel Imenu, the right girl. And this is amazing. Yaakov Avinu goes and gives Rachel the simanim. And you know what Rachel does? Rachel realizes. She also knows that her father is going to do the switch. And she realized that now her sister Leah is going to be set up for the greatest embarrassment in probably all of history. A girl, the night of her wedding, in her wedding dress, in front of the entire city, in front of everybody and anybody you ever knew, and she's going to be there under the chuppah, and the chatan is going to turn to the girl, to the kala, and he's going to ask her certain questions, and if she doesn't have those answers, Yaakov Avinu is going to shut down the entire ceremony and say, Lavan Ad Khan. He's going to unveil the girl and he's going to put his foot down and say, there's no way I'm going to let you get away with this. And what's going to be with her? She's going to have the most terrible, the greatest embarrassment in history. I don't think anyone would go through greater of an embarrassment than that. And Rachel Imenu realized that that was coming Leah's way, one way or another. So comes Rachel and says, I can't let that happen to her. So she gives her the simanim. She teaches her all the answers to the questions that Yaakov is going to ask under the chuppah. She teaches her the codes. And sure enough, Yaakov Avinu comes and asks the kala these questions. Little did he know it was Leah, taught by Rachel, the proper answers. And here she gives the answers correctly. Yaakov, suspecting and thinking that this is Rachel, goes through the chuppah. And the next morning, 
letter. What a story. Rabotai, could you imagine how much Rachel risked by doing this? Let's just put this in perspective. Number one, do you know that she risked her relationship with her future husband? You double-crossed me. Here I go. Me and you were in cahoots. We had a pact between us. Like this, your father couldn't trick us or mess up our biggest moment, our wedding. And you go and you sold me out. You sold me out. You took what I gave to you in secrecy, what I gave to you as sacred, and you gave it over to the person that I was doing this as not to fall to marry. How can I ever trust you again? Would it be so far-fetched for for Yaakov Avinu to say this to Rachel? You sold me out. We We did this in secrecy and you sold me out. I could never trust you again. Do you understand what she was putting on the line here? She was putting on the line that Yaakov Avinu might turn around and say, we're done. Now I don't want to marry you anymore. She was risking her future of a mother of Klali's. She was risking the Shvatim that were destined to come out from her. Yosef, Binyamin, Minashe, Ephraim. No such tribes. They would have came out maybe from the other Ima, but not from her. So she's risking marrying the Gadol Hador. She's risking becoming from Imahot of Klal Yisrael. She's risking her chelek in Klal Yisrael. The children, the shvatim were destined to... And she's putting it all on the line. Why? So that her sister doesn't get the Guinness Book of world-class embarrassments that ever took place in history. It's unbelievable. I think this is Unbelievable. What a risk. Rabotai, everything you heard from me till now, you heard already. There's nothing you heard up until this point that's a hedush to you. You know it, and then some. But now, Rabotai, I want to tell you something that I'm hoping you never heard. Something that I'm hoping is going to rewrite the story that we thought we knew so well. And it's going to give us an insight to what really took place that should change our lives in the way we deal with Klal Yisrael. Open your hearts, listen to this. Let me tell you the story behind the story. So we read in this week's parasha another episode. Reuven, he comes back from the field and he's holding the dudaim, these very unique and special, special flowers. It was the type of flowers that Chazal tell us had some sort of a something in it that was special and unique that someone that would digest these flowers, even if they were barren, would somehow or other be able to now have children. That's the way Chazal explained the unique strength of these very rare flowers. I know about these flowers. (laughs) My wife and I, we... uh, did not have an easy time. When we first married, it took us almost three and a half to four years till we finally had children. I know you guys probably heard the story in the past with the, uh, the German doctor that we had to deal with. But you should know, but before we came back to the United States and we started going around to all these doctors in year three and a half and four, in year one and two, when we were still in Israel in Kolel, when I was in Yeshiva Titri, I heard, I heard about these uh, farmers that were up in the mountains in Tveria, in Tiberias, who claimed that they have a Kabbalah, Adayom, that they know which flowers, and it supposedly blossoms only one time a year, are what they feel is the Dudaim of the Torah itself. And in essence, what they showed us was, it wasn't really flowers, there were little seeds on the inside of these flowers that if a woman who had a hard time getting pregnant would swallow, supposedly, 
It would open up her entire system to be childbearing. How does this work? I'm just telling you what I, I remember. I remember driving out to Tveria from Yerushalayim, two and a half hours, to be able to get these dudaim. And they weren't cheap either, I'll tell you that, on a, on a kolel guy uh, a budget. It was came out the rent of the whole month that they wanted just for a few, no, but listen, it was a very, they claimed it was very rare, very rare. And I gave it to my wife and I told it, I said, remember, it's not the flowers. And in a minute, you're going to find out. You're going to find out in a minute. It's not the flowers. But this is what Chazal tells us. Ruvain came back holding the Dudai. Rachel Imenu. She's now barren, waiting for children. Her sister Leah was already on her fourth kid. And here Rachel is still waiting for a child. And she sees Ruven brings back those famous Dudaim. And she turns to Leah and she asks, I want the flowers of your son. Please give me those flowers. I need them. She's insinuating, I have no kids. Those are the famous Dudaim. Says the Pasuk, what does Leah tell Rachel Imenu? Now listen to these words. This is the fireworks, Rabotai. This is a game changer, what I'm going to tell you right now. What does Leah answer to Rachel when Rachel asks for the flowers from Reuven? Answers Leah, Vatomer la. And Leah says to Rachel, Hamat kachtech et ishi. Isn't it enough that you took my husband from me, that he loves you more than he loves me? Now you want to take the flowers of my son as well? Isn't it bad enough that you took my husband? You want to take the flowers also from my son? What? Leah, what did you just say? Do you know who you're talking to? You're talking to Rachel. You're talking to the one who gave you the simanim under the chuppah. You're talking to the one that saved you from the, the world-class embarrassment in front of the entire town, in front of the entire family. If not for Rachel, you would not have had the simanim. Yaakov Avinu would have unveiled you on the spot. You would have went down in history as the most <laughs> embarrassing mevuyeshet of all eternity. She gave you the simanim. You're saying that she took your husband from you? She didn't take your husband. She gave you her husband. Do you know what type of risk Rachel was taking when she gave you those simanim? She might have lost her place by Yaakov Avinu. She might have lost her place in Klal Yisrael. She might have lost her Shvatim. And she did all of that just so that you shouldn't be embarrassed. Just so that you'll be able to marry the Gadol Hador. And you're crying out at her, how could you take my husband from me? She didn't take your husband. She gave you your husband. She's the reason why you're married in the first place. What's going on here? How in the world do you understand this pasuk? How do you understand the words that Leah suddenly attacks Rachel? How does this make sense? She gave you the simanim. You want to hear something incredible, Rabotai? Listen to this. It gets better. Rachel stays quiet. Doesn't answer back a word. Instead, Rachel says, you're right. So you know what? I'll make you a trade. I'll give you my night with Yaakov Avino in lieu of the flowers. Let's make a barter. Let's make a switch. Let's make a trade. Ah. You're going to give me an extra night with Yaakov? They made the deal. Leah took the extra night. The night that was supposed to go to Rachel. Rachel took the flowers. 
What's going on? What's pshat? What a pele this, what a question this is. What a pele on the whole story is this question. This question demands clarification better. This question demands justice. What's going on here? We're missing something so big. What's going on here? Ay, 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 Rabotai, the answer is astonishing, what I'm about to tell you now. Mom is astonishing. The answer is that Leah never knew that Rachel gave her the simani. What? <laughs> How's that possible? What do you mean? She was under the chuppah. What do you mean? When Yaakov came and asked all the questions, she had all the answers. Who taught her those answers? Rachel. So how in the world did Rachel teach her all the right answers to all the questions Yaakov will bring the answer? And because of that, she was able to get married. And at the same time, not know that Rachel gave her the simani? And the answer is yes. That is exactly what took place. You see, Rachel made a brilliant cheshbon. She made a cheshbon and said to herself, if I'm going to go and tell Leah that me and Yaakov are in cahoots and Yaakov gave me simanim and codes in order to make sure he doesn't end up marrying you, do you know what that's going to do to the relationship of Leah and Yaakov? If Leah finds out that Yaakov Avinu, who is suspecting Lavan the trickery, the trickster. If Yaakov suspected Lavan is up to something, we got to be able to really be careful. Let's go and make Simanim together to make sure that he doesn't give me your sister, only you. If Leah would have found out that Yaakov was in cahoots with Rachel making Simanim so that he doesn't marry Leah and only Rachel, how would Leah feel about living with Yaakov Avinu for the rest of her life? You never wanted me. Lehefech. Not only you never wanted me, you went out and did ma'amatzim as to make sure not to have me. Could you imagine living with that person for the rest of your life? And because of that, Rachel Imenu made a brilliant hejbol. I cannot tell Leah that these are the simanim Yaakov gave me as the code to make sure that this is Rachel under the chuppah and not Leah. Elamai, so how did she pull it off? How do you give somebody simanim without telling him that there are simanim? Comes Rachel and she was brilliant. And she came up with an unbelievable beheshbon. Says Chazal, what were the simanim? The simanim were the halachot of the laws of purity. Taharat mishpacha. Yaakov Avinu taught Rachel the entire Hilchot Taharat HaMishpacha. All the laws of Mikveh, all the laws of Nida, all the laws of purity, purity of the home, Taharat HaMishpacha. And it was those Halachot that were the Simanim under the Chuppah. And when the time comes, Yaakov is going to walk under the Chuppah, he's going to turn to the Kala, to Rachel, and he's going to say to her, how many days until you get clean? How, when is it that you make a moch? When do you make a hefsek? How many days does it take until you go to mikveh? What does it mean a, uh, a tkufa? What does it mean an, an ona'ah? What does it, he, he's, he's going to test her on all the laws of ta'arat mishpacha and the answers were the simanim on the chupa. Comes Rachel and does something brilliant. She turns to Leah and she says, Leah, you're about to get married. I need to get you a Kala teacher. Rachel was the first Kala teacher in history. And you want to hear something funny? Rachel was the only single 
call a teacher in history. <laughs> unbelievable. Anyways, you think about it, it's unbelievable. Never, ha- never will happen that a single, I'm, I'm, not that I know of, at least I shouldn't say that, you never know. There might have been certain countries, that, well, who knows? But we never heard of, that's what I should, that's what I should say. A single girl, call a teacher? But she was taught by the Gadol Adar. She knows her stuff. I'm sure when Yaakov Avinu gave over the sugya, he gave it with all the marmikomot. I'm sure he gave it over like the way Yaakov Avinu learned in Shem Ve'ever. But the point is, Rachel brilliantly comes to Leah and says, Leah, you're getting married. You need to know the halachot. You're going to marry the Gadol Adar. You need to know the halachot of Tarat HaMishpacha. Come, let me teach it to you. Little did Leah know what Leah thought was the Kala teacher getting her ready for marriage, but in a very quiet and secretive way, she was giving her all the simani that would save her embarrassment. Under the chuppah, when the great Gadol Yaakov Avinu comes, under the chuppah and asks the questions. Leah thought Yaakov was asking her the questions under chuppah just to make sure that she was up to date so that she knows what she needs to do so that she's ready to get married. Oh, I see you, Taka learned. I see you graduated the course of the uh, Kala teacher course. Great, now we can get married. That's the way Leah took it. He was just making sure that I knew the halacha so that we'll be able to actually go on with the marriage. And through this brilliant camouflage, Rachel was able to hide this secret that would have broken the heart of Leah in regard to Yaakov Avinu for a lifetime. Not just an embarrassing moment under the chuppah that she saved her from. She saved her from agony. Agony. Hurt and pain. For a lifetime, if she would have found out that she was marrying someone, that Be'etzem were doing quiet ma'amatzim behind the scenes to make simanim, to make sure it would be Rachel and nobody else. Brilliant. And now it all makes sense. So now we go now, Rabotai, to the moment of truth. And here Reuven comes from the field. I, I, this, is, this is too much. Reuven comes from the field with the Dudaim. And he's holding the unique flowers. Rachel sees, oh, those are the flowers of fertility for those who had problems with infertility. She says, I'm Akara, I need those flowers. She goes to Leah. Leah, can I have the flowers of your son, Reuven? Leah says, what? Hame'at kachtechet ishi. Isn't it enough that you took my husband, that he loves you more? You're going to take now Dudae Bini? She had no clue. She had no clue. What do you mean? <laughs> Rachel. Answer her back. Rachel, tell her. I took your husband. I gave you your husband. I gave you the sea money. No. She had no clue. It was done in the most perfect of ways. With such a camouflage. With such a, uh, how would we say, a certain empathy of a feeling for someone else's feelings, not just under the chuppah, but her feelings of marriage for a lifetime. From here you see that Be'etzem, Le'ah, had no clue. And now you see the genius of Rachel. And after she gets yelled at, it doesn't say a word. Ha'bolem piv ulshono. You know what the Gemara says? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what it is, Shomer, we call Tzadot Nafsho. You know what it is, that the Mechaperim Aleim call Avonotehem. You know what it is, Kizerach Hashemesh Aharet Tzaharayim. All these are the Shonot of the Gemara about the person that kept their mouth quiet and didn't answer back when someone came after them 
and pounced on them and attacked them with words. And they turned her cheek and they kept quiet. And in this case, even more so. Not only did she keep quiet, but she kept the secret. So while her sister is blasting her, she remains quiet as not to give up the secret that would have hurt and destroyed her marriage for life. Rachel says, you're right. You're right. So let's make a deal. Let's switch it out. Rabotai, listen to me well. It wasn't the Dudaim. It was the fact that Rachel stayed quiet. That was the moment that Bore Olam said, Ah! You stay quiet? You stay quiet after getting blasted from the person that you did a veldt for? Habolem pivul shono. And you stay quiet. Now, now was the etrat song. It was camouflaged by the Duda. But don't miss the real Vart. This was the moment. Somebody comes and pounces on another person and rips them to pieces verbally and they don't answer back. That's the power that this person has. And they have a power to give a bracha. And they have a power of an etrat son that at that moment in Shamayim, what they ask for, they get. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And right after this, Rachel Imenu miraculously has her first pregnancy. It's unbelievable. Rabotai, how big was this moment? Well, we just said, Habolem Pivul Shono. But I want to tell you another side to this moment. I want to tell you a side that later on, the Midrash and Eicha writes, a Midrash that you all know. Everybody knows this Midrash. That the moment the Bet HaMikdash caught fire and it began to burn down, Abraham Avinu comes in front of Borei Olam and says, Abba, 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 bizchuti, that I took my son on the Akedah. Please, forgive them. Hashem says to Abraham Avinu, leave me. Yitzchak Avinu comes in front of Bore Olam as the Bet HaMikdash is burning down. And he says, Bore Olam, I climbed up on the Mizbeach and put my hands out voluntarily to be tied. Forgive them. Don't destroy the Bet HaMikdash. Bore Olam says, leave me. Yaakov Avinu comes, Bore Olam, I never complained to you, not with the Tzarot of Esav, not with the Tzarot of Lavan, not with the Tzarot of Dina, not with the Tzarot of Yosef. Everything in life that you brought to me, I took and I accepted as my best. Abba, for my zechut, the Bechir Avot, Yaakov Avinu, forgive them. Save the Bet HaMikdash. Hashem says, Leave me. Ay, ay, ay. Then the Midrash tells us something that we all know. Kol birama nishma. A voice, a very, a very light, quiet voice comes up to Bore Olam. The voice of Rachel Imenu. And she says, Bore Olam, is it possible that a human being is capable of Rachmanut Greater than you, Hashem? When I had everything to lose and I still gave the simanim to my, to my sister as not to be embarrassed. I had mercy on her above everything else. And you can't have mercy on Klal Yisrael and forgive them? Says Borei Olam. Oh! That's what I wanted to hear. Rachel Mevaka Albane. Vishavu banim ligvulam. Hashem made a promise in your zechut, Rachel. Not Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. It's unbelievable. In your zechut of what you did, Rachel. You showed this unbelievable empathy and feeling for somebody else. On such a level. Not just that you saved the embarrassment of the chupa. Tonight we found out so much bigger. 
The way she did it was brilliant. It was in a way that the person themselves didn't even know. And because of that, it safeguarded not just the embarrassment of the chuppah, but a lifetime of marriage to Yaakov Avinu. She would never be able to show her face in front of her husband if she knew what really went down. Your Rachmanut was ongoing. It was perfect. It was brilliant. Yes, if you're capable of that type of Rachmanut as a human being, says Borei Olam, then I'm capable of that Rachmanut to forgive Klal Yisrael the final Geula, the bringing of Mashiach and the building of the Bet HaMikdash. Look what this moment brought. <laughs> Unbelievable. Look what it brought. It brought a havtacha, a promise. V'shavu banim likbula. At the end of this galut, after all the craziness that we're going through, this is the moment. This is an amazing moment. This is the reason why Rabotai, parashat vayichi. Listen to this. Yaakov Avino calls for Yosef to come down to Goshen to speak to him. You would ask yourself, Yosef was away from his father from 22 years. Wouldn't he buy, be by him in Egypt every day? Could you imagine that? A son is estranged from his father for 22 years. Bal Korho. Against his will. Finally they're reunited. Finally your father is brought to you. To your place. Vicery of Egypt. And yet, he has to call you to come. Aren't you by him every single day? Says Rabbeinu Bachia, no. Yosef refused to come to his father in the years that Yaakov was in Mitzrayim. Why? Very good, Eddie. Because Yosef was scared. What happens if my father turns around and asks, No, Yosef, tell me, what really happened? How'd you get here? Did you, did you, did you understand this? If I would read you now the Midrash, that described the moment of Mechirat Yosef, I am telling you, you and I together would cry. Mamash, emotional tears. Such an emotional medrash. Yosef wrapped his arms around the leg of Shimon and begged him, begged him, don't do it, I'm your brother, have mercy. I'm your brother, I'm your brother. And Shimon was trying to, 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 to shuffle, shuffle him off. They were pushing him back and forth. And he was running to each one, begging, pleading. He came to the Bnei Shvahot. You're my best friends. How are you doing this to me? You're selling me to Ben Yishmaelim. You read that Midrash, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You read that Midrash, Echa. I'm telling you, straight. 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 You'll cry. And after all that, the father who he adored the father who he loved, the father that Yosef had a father that believed in him. And because of Yaakov, Yosef was able to survive everything he went through. Yosef was supposed to be the fourth of the Avot HaKadoshim. There was supposed to be four Imahot and four Avot. Yosef was supposed to be the fourth. See, he was bra kare de avuha. He was an extension of his father. He was mamish a shtick Yaakov Avinu Yosef. He was the one that got the Torah from those years of Shem Ever. Who did Yaakov Avinu give that Torah to? To Yosef. That was part of the jealousy. And yet, after 22 years of crying over the missing of your father, he finally comes down to Mitzrayim and you don't go visit him for years. Making excuses? I'm busy in government. I'm busy in... Says Rabbeinu Bachia, because he didn't want to be put in a position to be asked what happened. And he'd have to tell his father what his brothers did. He didn't want to bring the shame to his brothers. Does... Sorry. He didn't want to bring shame to his brothers. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? Like mother, like son? 
Where do you get kahot like this? He got it from his mother. What his mother did for her sister is what Yosef did for his brothers. In, in a mishunadika way, in a, in a tremendous, in, in a way beyond that we can grasp. These were giants. They were giants. They were giants. They were giants. And they were giving over to us in our DNA. This is the way you handle with a brother. This is the way you handle a sister. This is the way you handle a family member. This is the way you deal with another Jew. This is the way you deal with Ahenu, B'nai Israel. This is the way it was meant to be. It's unbelievable. So Yaakov calls Yosef down and tells him, Yosef, I'm relying on you with your strength in government. That the time I die, I want you to pull the strings to allow that I could be brought out of Egypt and up to Eretz Yisrael. And then Yaakov Avinu turns and says to Yosef, and I know what you're thinking. Abba, you want me to take you out and bury you, Marat HaMachpelah? You didn't do that for my mother. You buried her on the side of the road. And now you're asking me to be able to take you up to Eretz Yisrael, Marat HaMachpelah. Va'ani bivoimi padan aram. I remember the Rebbe in Chedah is still singing it. I memorize this in Yiddish as a young boy in Teferis Ali Melech. Would you believe it? Meta alai Rachel. You hear this? You, you cry, you cry your heart. Rashi says over there, Yaakov said, I know you're angry at me, Yosef. I know you feel that when it came to your mother's burial, I came up short on her. I should have brought her into Eretz Yisrael and buried her in Ma'arat HaMachpelah. Instead, where did I put her? Derech Bet Lechem, on the side of a road. I know you're upset. Says Yaakov Avinu, but understand, Hashem told me to bury her. Because when Klal Yisrael is going to be driven out of Israel, when the Bet Amidash is destroyed, Nevuzaradan Harasha is going to be bringing them out of Israel, out to Babylon. They're going to go down that road. And they're going to stop by Kever Rachel. And they're going to cry their eyes out. And Rachel's going to go up to Hashem. And Rachel's going to say, Abba, how could it be? How could it be that my Rachmanut was greater than yours? And Hashem says, Oh, Rachel Mivaka Baneha. They're being driven out now, but I promise you, Rachel, and your Zichut, Vishavu Banim Likbula. This came from a moment that one Jew stood up and made sure that they were so empathetic that they took the feelings of another Jew and placed it first. That's a step out of this gallot. Thank you for listening, guys.